Hello, welcome to tonight's online event from British Library. My name's Tan Kirk and I'm the lead curator of the current British Library exhibition, Fantasy Realms of Imagination, which, is, which this event accompanies. Um, the exhibition's on till 25th of February, so you still have a chance to see it if you haven't already. It's an exploration of the whole history of fantasy from its roots and some of the oldest forms of storytelling right up to the present day. And we demonstrate in the exhibition how the genre has exploded beyond the written word into art, film, TV, music, gaming, fan culture, all different media. Um, we're really, really proud of the way the exhibition's been received by the fantasy community. One of the key sections of the exhibition covers fairy tales. Um, these stories are often among the first that we hear in childhood, but they've been incredibly important as inspiration and source material for fantasy. We show examples of in the incursion of the fairy realm into our own world and the often dramatic results. We explore the motif of the enchanted forest and we demonstrate how the happy, happily ever after trope has been subverted in fairy tale and fantasy alike. Angela Carter, of course, features in the exhibition with both her translation of the classic fairy tales of Charles Perrault and the manuscript of her dark feminist retelling of the genre, The Bloody Chamber. The British Library holds Angela Carter's archive, which consists of a wealth of manuscript material, including diaries, notebooks, letters, drafts of novels, outline for short stories and research notes. And we're really delighted to welcome tonight our speakers, Kelly Link, Marina Warner and Terry Windling. Uh, they'll be talking to our chair, Amal Elmatar, who is an award-winning writer of fiction, poetry and criticism and the New York Times' science fiction and fantasy columnist. Her work has appeared in collections The Gin Falls in Love and Other Stories, The Starlit Wood, New Fairy Tales and The Honey Month. And she is the co-author with Max Gladstone of the multi -award, multiple award-winning and absolutely amazing This Is How You Lose the Time War. Um, you are very welcome to submit questions for the panel. Um, so through, all through the event, just uh, use the form below the video window at any point and we'll read out some of the best questions later on. And if you'd like to buy a book, there's a great selection to be found via the books tab at the top of the screen, including short plug for our, our, um, the book of the exhibition, which is called Realms of Imagination, um, which you'll be able to buy there, which has um, includes contributions from both Marina and Terry and also uh, an essay specifically about Angela Carter. Um, I hope you have a wonderful time at the event and come and see the exhibition. Thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Amal now. It is my great honor to introduce, uh, without further ado, everyone else on this panel. Um, everyone on this panel has been a sort of giant of uh, literature for me personally, uh, and probably for many of you watching. Um, <clears throat> So we have uh, Kelly Link, whose most recent book, White Cat, Black Dog, is a collection of ingeniously reinvented fairy tales. Her collection, Get in Trouble, 20, from 2014, was a Pulitzer Prize finalist, a national bestseller, and named one of the best books of the year in multiple uh, publications. She's the author of three other collections, Stranger Things Happen, Magic for Beginners, and Pretty Monsters. Her short stories have been published in numerous uh, magazines, including A Public Space, Tin House, One Story, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, <clears throat> and many others. Uh, she currently lives with her husband and daughter in Northampton, Massachusetts, and was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the Genius Grant. Uh, in our household, we refer to her as literal genius, Kelly Link, as a consequence, uh, in 2018. And her debut novel, The Book of Love, will be published by Head of Zeus on the 8th of February of this year. So uh, mark your calendars. It's tremendous. Um, Terry Windling is an American writer, editor, artist, and folklorist specializing in fantasy and the mythic arts, and has been serving on the advisory board for the British Library's fantasy exhibition, uh, so has been partially responsible for a lot of the amazing things that you've seen in the series. Uh, she has published over 40 books and received over 10 World Fantasy Awards, including the Life Achievement Award in 2022, the, Mytho the Mythopoic Award uh, for her wonderful novel, The Woodwife, um, as well as the Bram Stoker Award and the SFWA Solstice Award for outstanding contributions to the speculative fiction field. As a fantasy editor since the 1980s, she has long been a champion of novels and stories rooted in the fairy tale tradition. And with Ellen Datlow, she co-edited the award-winning Snow White, Blood Red series of adult fairy tales, as well as numerous other anthologies exploring themes from folklore and myth. She also notably created the Tor Books fairy tale series of novels based on classic stories. 
A former New Yorker, Terry now lives in a small village on Dartmoor with her British husband, who is a dramatist and puppeteer. And um, I'm very excited to, uh, to talk about all this. And last but most certainly not least, uh, Marina Warner is an award-winning novelist, short story writer, historian, and mythographer who works across genres and cultures exploring myths, stories, and fairy tales. Her books include Fly Away Home, Once Upon a Time, A Short History of Fairy Tale, Stranger Magic, Charmed States in the Arabian Nights, Forms of Enchantment, Writings on Art and Artists, and Inventory of a Life Mislaid, an unreliable memoir, which is one of the most delightful titles I've ever read. Um, she is Professor of English and Creative Writing at Birkbeck College in London, a Distinguished Fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, a Fellow of the British Academy, and former President of the Royal Society of Literature. And I want to actually hand things over to Marina to start us off, uh, because when we talk about fairy tale, at least I certainly have this tendency, uh, the word fairy tale sort of accretes to itself a lot of other fantastic forms. Um, I certainly have tended to use it almost synonymously sometimes with folktale, folklore, um, fairy stories and stuff like that. But um, I wondered if uh, you could start us off with a definition of the literary fairy tale um, and specifically with a view to what the material that Angela Carter, who we're going to be discussing a little bit, uh, referred to and used. So I'll toss it over to you, Marina. <laughs> Thank you for an enormous task. And I must say, I feel I feel quite Coward and to be, or, or, or kind of humble to be um, trying to do this in such company because Terry's written an essay, a wonderful essay in the uh, book, in, your, in the book of the exhibition about fairy tales, and of course has, knows much more about fairy tales than I do. But I will try and, with the perspective of Angela Carter, try and pick out some, some themes. Well, first of all, as many people have pointed out, and I think the exhibition says, fairies are not essential to the fairy tale. They don't always appear at all, um, but but there is an element of supernatural. Probably the core definition, the DNA of fairy tales, is that some supernatural intervention happens. The mortal world and this immortal world clash and coincide. Sometimes they fuse in a harmonious way, but not very often. The other thing that, that comes very much to mind, and I think you mentioned it, is the traditional happy ending. That's also rather misleading. Because even a very, very famous core fairy tale, such as Red Riding Hood, in its early printed version by, by Charles Perrault, ends with the wolf eating the child. And there's, so there are no fairies there. There's a talking wolf, but no fairies, and a, and a sort of an unhappy ending, which after all does thrill children to listen to, but it's still not exactly a happy ending. Um, so beyond. Um, the thing, the thing is, it becomes an area of exploration. Once, once the supernatural enters, it doesn't actually connect to religion, but it opens up a field of possible inquiry. And in that sense, it's appealed to people like Angela Carter, who was herself a rationalist. I mean, she proclaims that. Mm -hmm. And she, she wanted to use fantasy to, to, to extend the area of exploration. And in her case, it's sort of modified from sexuality and erotica to other things, family, lineage, connection, performance towards the end of her life, and politics, a lot of politics in her work. Um, fairy in English is related to words that do have a bearing, I think, rather than fairies as beings. Words that such as fae or fated, now these catch the characteristic pleasures and frisson of the fairy tale, the fate that works in almost inexorably sometimes. And the enchantments are central but they're often ambiguous, they're shivery and creepy. And another word for fairy tale that has been used is wonder tale, because there are wonders, and Arabic has an excellent term, which is the literature of astonishment, ajaib. And this is actually very helpful to understanding a fairy tale. This is part of ajaib, it is part of the literature of astonishment. You wonder at it, you wonder as a form of inquiry, and you wonder, you stand back in astonishment. Um, then. There's also, apart from the fairy tale, which is a tends to be a short piece of literature, there is also the fairy way of writing, which is much larger than the single fairy tale. So the fairy way of writing encompasses things like Narnia and much many of the fantasy books in in, in the fantasy stories and books and works in the in the show. It's um, it 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 goes beyond literature into plays and films 
uh, well, plays of literature, but of films, and uh, it features fairies and has they have a fairy tale character uh, that is larger than the simple fairy tales. So Mid Midsummer Night's Dream is a good example of that. There are fairies in it, but it's not a fairy tale. It doesn't have the structure of a fairy tale, and it um, it but it it it, it, meet, it meets the supernatural, and then the main thing that I think concerns us as women here is that there is a a, a, a very strong sense that the fairy tale is ancient, that it has come down through generations, and that many women have participated in its making. It's a, it's rather like a tapestry. It's been made over time by many hands. And those hands are very often women, and it reflects a lot of women's experience. So this is why it's become, and became for Angela too, a tremendous field of inquiry into women's sexuality, women's lives, women's drudgery, and so forth. And they, they kept this, this idea of the oral, oral origin tends to be kept in mind, even when we have an author like Terry herself, or, or Kelly, they, even when they, they they are clearly writing and they're clearly authoring it, sometimes their work will very often hark back to a sense of generations before that have helped this imaginary realm to exist. And that sense of lineage across time, I think, is very important to fairy tale. There isn't a there is originality in the inauguration of a new story, but there's also a, a, a kind of acknowledgement of debt of tradition of being belonging to some collective, large collective world. And then the, finally, just in relation to Angela Carter, these, this material has been worked and reworked and the marvelous word of Alice Oswald, the poet, transshifted. It has been transshifted over time into many, many different shapes and forms. And that quality of metamorphosis, fairy tales are about metamorphosis very often, but they also in themselves metamorphic. They're, they're constantly changing. And we have two great practitioners here. So so I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Marina. Um, that was wonderful. That was, uh, it lays out before us this, this feast of things I really want to, uh, to share. Lot, there's a lot more to say, but I won't say. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, one of the things that you said that I, I, a thread that I really want to pull on to start us off uh, is this idea of um, a fairy tale as lineage and inheritance and inheritance, but also of debt at the same time, which I think is a, a beautiful duality, strangely. Um, of course, when we, you know, the, the traditional way that people will will think of to start a fairy tale is once upon a time, there's a kind of a temporality to the location, uh, sorry, not to the, to the, to the location in time of the fairy tale. And something that is, uh, it's, it's of great interest to me that that atemporality, that outsideness of time uh, lends itself to temporal transmission in the way that it does. On this panel, I, I could not escape this as we were putting it together. Um, we are all four of us, um, three different generations, you know, as these things get reckoned. And I think between us, I, I literally did look at Wikipedia for this, I'm sorry, but we are about uh, 10 to 15 years apart in, in descending mm -hmm. order. order. Um, and I think that there, the fact that all of us have uh, reference to a common body of fairy tale literature, but also have an awareness laterally of each other's work and reinvention and, and reinterpretation of fairy tales is something that's very, very interesting to me. So I thought to start us off, I just wanted to um, ask each of you, um, how did you first come to fairy tale? Uh, Tanya mentioned in the beginning that, you know, there's often an association of fairy tale and childhood, but I think those of us who are, you know, uh, fairy tale scholars know that that is relatively recent, that for a long time, fairy tales were adult stories about, uh, especially like adult women talking to each other about their experiences and so on, or writing those down. Uh, but in the last 150 years or so, there has been a very strong association of fairy tales and children and childhood. And I just wonder, how did you first come to um, an encounter with fairy tales? And I wondered if I could ask uh, Kelly to start us off. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I my, my, my mother has recently moved uh, up to Massachusetts, where I live, and brought with her one of my first books of fairy tales, which I remembered as being very beautiful. And it is a uh, 
Reader's Digest, enormous compendium of fairy tales with really terrible illustrations, um, which I remember as being beautiful and, and very evocative. Um, but for me, uh, you know, that was sort of a, a path into other anthologies or collections by people like Andrew Lang. Um, and then uh, sort of a second discovery of fairy tales when I was in uh, grad school um, of writers like Angela Carter, the anthologies that Terry and Ellen Datlow were putting out. Um, and also because I was working in a kid's bookstore, the series of really beautiful um, picture books, sort of prestige picture books by uh, incredible artists of different tellings of, of fairy tales that I knew but in slightly different shapes. Did you by any chance, when I, the, you said picture book and it made me think of Trina Shart Hyman. Was, was that one of them by any chance? Right. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, Terry, how about you? Well, I, I come from a generation, um, I grew up in this, I was a small child in the 60s and that's a generation after Angela Carter, but before you, Kelly. Um, and at that time, fairy tales growing up in America, people's conception of fairy tales was very dominated by Walt Disney. Mm. But I had the great fortune to be given a fairy tale book as a child. Um, and it was this fairy tale book, which is uh, the Golden Book of Fairy Tales. <laughs> and it's a translation of a French edition. And I have the French edition too, which I've acquired <laughs> since. Um, of old tales that were not it's a volume for children but the tales are not as watered down as was as was common in the 60s with the kind of disneyfied versions that were presented for children whether they were produced by disney or, or not many of the editions of fairy tales you would get in those days were very simplified mm. very watered down and this volume was not and it was because it came out of france originally it contained a lot of the old fairy tale writers not just Perrault but people like Madame Delnoy yes. uh, Madame Le Prince de Beaumont and so I was introduced to fairy tale in something closer to their the literary form they mm -hmm. assumed in the in 17th century France and got some of that real power of the stories the mm -hmm. the glimmerings of the adult dark sensual qualities of the stories, the power struggles and relationships of the stories, um, all of which had been stripped away by the time you got to 1960s America. I, so growing up with that book, I uh, developed an enormous taste for fairy tales, partly because I grew up in a very difficult family, a very difficult and violent home. And these stories spoke to me of what I was facing every day with yes. power dynamics, violence, cruelty. I, I couldn't get enough of them. And when I eventually made my way to university, I really wanted to study fairy tales. And I was a generation too soon and not in the right place. I was in a small hippie liberal arts college in rural Ohio. And there was a mythology professor, but there was there was no way to, to study folklore and fairy tales. He did his best to point me in the right direction. But um, I had to kind of find my way. Uh, Jack Zipes' first book came out the same year that The Bloody Chamber did. Marina's magnificent book on um, From the Beast to the Blonde on fairy tales and their tellers was years in the future. Maria Tarter's books were years in the future. I knew that women's history of what fairy tales have been over the centuries was there, but I didn't know where to find it. Mm -hmm. so, so when I read the Bloody Chamber for the first time in 1979 and saw her hearkening back to an older and more adult way of telling fairy tales. It just hit me like a locomotive. I completely agree. I mean, Antricart had completely freed me because I had felt that it was very wrong. There was a long movement in the early 60s mm -hmm. of feminist writers writing against fairy tales. Yes. Magnificently. Anne Sexton's poems are magnificent. But they're very acerbic and very damning of the yeah. Cinderella story or the Cinderella plot and or in uh, the Sleeping Beauty, all these all these types, all these passive types. 
And so I felt very, you know, I felt very silent about my actual taste for fairy tales. Which yes, is exactly. I mean, I was lucky because my father was a bookseller. So mm. I was very, very much surrounded by books when I was a child, which was wonderful. And I had Andrew Lang, um, which um, also Angela was very influenced by Andrew Lang too. So, so the, 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 and that was a very, I mean, that's important because something I didn't say earlier, which is that fairy tales are found all over the world. And Andrew Lang put them in. He rather, he, met, he sort of mashed up, or he had a team of women writers, including his wife, who kind of rewrote the stories. So they're not actually the most flavorsome. And I wouldn't recommend them now to children because they're prosy also. There's very Wardian prose. But 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 actually, when I was a child, it was still very, very exciting. But he tells the Icelandic sagas, the Greek myths. He mixes it all in. Mm. Where the fairy tale, you know, the fairy tale definition is really completely exploded. But um, mm. certainly... And then I came across, I mean, this is a sort of little anecdote from the 60s, but it gives you a flavor of the 60s, which is I was a journalist and I was sent to interview Marianne Faithful, the singer, and who was a huge star in those, the, the, then. And, um, and she was collecting fairy tale, illustrated fairy tale books. And she oh. showed me Edmund Dulac and, oh. and Arthur Rackham, all these beautiful books which she was collecting. And that completely, I mean, fired me up. It's it's absolutely wonderful to me to hear you, um, to to hear you, uh, Marina and Terry specifically talking about um, this this completely different landscape. I uh, I was born in 1984. I I like I have known a sort of um, mainstream saturation of fairy tales, mm -hmm. um, and and imagining that there was a point at which there was not, uh, I mean, a, a totally different affect towards them. Like when you say that. Uh, in the 60s, women were writing against fairy tales is something that's a very it's deep interest to me because uh, I think that reading fairy tales against their grain has been part of the palette mm. available to people of, of my generation for as long as I've been reading uh, and so on. So knowing that, you know, feeling that there is an origin point that is, you know, mm. accessible through you is, is tremendous to me. I and wonder how so like Marina, it made you feel like you were somehow a bad feminist. Yeah. To to, to sure. love these stories. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it was so and exciting when not not just Angela Carter, but all the feminist scholars came on the scene to to show us why it was okay to be moved by the, this yes, material. Yes. But I mean one of the things, the stumbling blocks, oh, but also was a point of inquiry for me, was that there was so much misogyny in the fairy tale. Yeah. Of course, Angela Carter wanted to unlock that too, and um, and and that's it was one of the spurs to my work on fairy tales. Why did we, why did women tell these stories? Mm -hmm. And so much much of the stories is about women fighting other women. Marina, can I ask? Did did you were you acquainted with Angela Carter? Did you ever meet? Oh yes, no, I knew her well. Oh, yes, okay. I first I first met her when she came in. She actually published one of the Beauty and the Beast versions that she wrote I think the courtship of Dr. Mr. Lyon in Vogue and so she and I used to work for Vogue um, it was for, it wasn't actually for Vogue that I was interviewing Marianne Faithful but I could have been but uh, <laughs> but so she 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 was she was a contributor and she came in that's when I first met her this was before the bloody chamber so she came in wearing a red berry and she had red hair then and um and um she and I'd read her very early books the um the one with the honey, honey, uh, what's it called? The wicked character. And her, anyway, she she wrote these very powerful um, studies of love and destruction long before the Bloody Chamber. The Bristol Trilogy. Mm? The Bristol Trilogy. That, yes, um, exactly. Yes. Mm. I, I, well, I Shattered. wanted to offer, by way of, by way of sort of closing the circle, uh, I was aware of uh, of Angela Carter as an important figure uh, in in literature generally in, in fairy tales specifically um, but I I was a latecomer to actually reading her work it was she was a sort of you know mountain in the distance that I knew I wanted to climb <laughs> essentially but I didn't actually read the bloody chamber until this is very embarrassing I'm outing myself here but uh, I didn't read it until um, 
the end of 2020 because uh, I had a, a friend had a, a copy of um, the Penguin Classics 2015 edition, which Kelly Link had an introduction uh, to. And I pounced on it because I saw Kelly's name on it, because I thought this is the version that I, the, this is the edition I actually want to read. I want to know what Kelly Link, whose work I love and know well, uh, has to say about Angela Carter. And the uh, introduction was, was, I mean, it's so beautiful. I highly, highly recommend that everyone. That's a magnificent <laughs> introduction. Yeah, that everyone obtained this edition uh, to read it. Um, but it was it's an introduction that specifically, you know, talked about living with Carter's work as a writer um, mm -hmm. and the um, the the sort of uh, transformation that that enabled. So I wanted to just read a tiny bit uh, from the introduction to kind of um, uh, engage this this conversation further. So what what Kelly wrote um, when in, like reading Carter's retellings in the uh, the Bloody Chamber, what she was doing, of course, was rewiring some very old stories. But it felt as if it were me, the reader slash writer me, who was being reconfigured in some necessary way. I needed to see how stories could be in conversation with other stories. And, and it felt very potent to me in, in regard to the conversation I wanted to have here because um, so much of our, to me, so much of the work of feminism is of, besides trying to advance the cause of women's rights, uh, it is about maintaining a sense of conversation and lineage among women across generations because there is this frustrating and difficult tendency to sort of salt the earth behind us uh, in terms of any new um, push forward in terms of rights or what have you. I, I always uh, feel like when I'm reading uh, women from previous centuries and stuff that they all seem lonely in their writing as women. You know, Emily Barrett Browning uh, saying, um, I, I look around for grandmothers and find none uh, or um, just uh, the, the sense that so, so many women who emerge or, or are preserved in our can, canons of English literature for a long time are preserved as sort of singular eminences and not as part of lineages or mm -hmm. uh, groups of women in conversation with each other as, as having contemporaries. Um, so I, anyways, I wanted to, uh, from there, just sort of toss it to you, Kelly, um, in terms of uh, do you want to speak a little bit to your encounters with the Bloody Chamber specifically um, and how how you use Carter um, in your own writing or how Carter's retelling speak to you? Sure. I, I guess I would start by saying that um, books are always in conversation with other books, that writers are in conversation with the books that, that spoke to them. Uh, but those connect those connective places those tissues are not always evident um that that you may not be it may seem to you the reader that the book is in conversation with other books that you've read but you don't necessarily know if those are the books that the the writer was responding to with the exception i think of of fairy tales um because we we know them as readers, at least uh, people of my generation, your generation, who have lived now in a world saturated uh, with with good and bad and terrible and strange uh, reworkings or sort of reconfigurations of fairy tales, that that those things are very easy to spot um, in when 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 we are when we are readers, um, and I think a lot about. Uh, the very basic patterns of fairy tales and how powerful they are. That if if you say once upon a time, um, or if you uh, come across prose or a description that says something is as red as blood, um, as white as snow, then already the writer is um, speaking in a cadence that you recognize as whether consciously is not or not uh, as coming out of out of fairy tales. Um, and I think Angela Carter is is so distinctly herself that that her voice is is so 
lively um, and um, body and playful and sort of uh, drenched in vividness um, that that I don't, in terms of, um, you know, this is not the way that I work. It's not the way that I write. I often read a writer like Angela Carter. There are very few writers like her, but someone who's access to and comfort with the possibilities of language is so broad. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I don't write like that. My, my normal writing voice is much closer to the range that I have when I, when I speak, I think of my vocabulary as being much more limited, but what it did do was to reading her taught me, um, I think, um, a lot about the presence of of the narrative voice, the presence of the voice of the writer, the eye of the writer, mm-hmm. and how when you read Carter, she interposes herself on the page. She breaks up the story with asides, with um, language that is coming. Um, that's it's not meant to be transparent. It's it's uh, a kind of embellishment, and it's unclear sometimes if the embellishment is the story on her voice or her voice on the story, but they're woven together um, in a way that uh, as a writer, when I read her, I think all things are possible. You know, that that uh, here, is, here is a approach which is so wild, so transgressive, uh, so saturated with herself uh, that, that, that it seems to me that there's infinite permission as a writer to, um, to filter through, to, to filter what the story that you were telling through yourself. Mm. I, think, I think that it's important to not to forget that Carter is very irreverent, mm. extremely provocative. Yes. She's, she's iconoclastic. So there's, there's, I mean, when, when we say she's feminist, you know, she was absolutely derided by feminists because she wrote at the same time as, as the Bloody Chamber, she wrote The Sade and Woman, which is a kind of, and the Marquis de Sade is a figure who overshadows the bloody chamber too. Mm. She's not only speaking to women writers at all in the past. I mean, she's not in conversation with them. She's in conversation with Oscar Wilde, with someone like Aubrey Beardsley, with mm. some with often with perversity and delinquency. And she, you know, she called her book collected essays nothing sacred, expletives deleted. She had a, you know, in life she had a foul mouth. Uh, on purpose. I mean, it was very studied. It wasn't because she was, you know, um, sort of she, from there was something a choice that she was making to be to be combative, and she remained very, very, you know, very much against the mainstream. And part and part of her re- approach to fairy tales was to dis- to crack them open in a way that was iconoclastic. They were no longer sweet. They no longer, you know, they were no longer charming. They were full of these. Uh, forces and I agree absolutely with Kelly that she was an amazing wordsmith but and part of that interpolation that she puts her voice in she she really makes you jump as you as she introduces these twists she changes I mean the wonderful ending of the tiger's bride yes. or the company of wolves when the tiger's bride turns into also an I think it's that one and then and uh, you know, the, I, she licked the drop he locked the drops of my beautiful fur she's now got beautiful fur and then and the beautiful ending of Company of Wolves, I think, when sweet and sound, she yeah. she sleeps between the pet, the paws of the tender wolf. You know this this kind of jump that she makes. It was it was to to shake up. She she was a figure of the sixties, and and you know she, she read a lot of theory, a lot of political theory. She was a child of you know Herbert Marcuse. She wanted to shake things up. She wanted a revolution. Mm. She hit, and she, you know, she. We've all forgotten that, but you know, the bourgeoisie was the enemy, and she was anti-bourgeois. And then her, then her writing takes a different phase because the later fairy tale books, which are like fairy tales but not fairy, not tales, um, the Knights of the Circus and Wise Children, draw a lot on fairy tale material, fairy tale plots, fairy tale characters, but they are benign by comparison to. I mean, she mellowed a lot, and she'd had a child herself, and it made a difference to her. Mm. The other thing I think is hard to grasp if you're coming upon Angela Carter now is that you know, 
the bloody chamber coming out in 1979 and those of us reading it in 79 80 81 at least in america that was the age when in mainstream literature um, minimalism was mm -hmm. taking hold you know gordon lish and ann Beatty and uh, and to read someone whose language was so rich and rococo and it was liberating mm -hmm. for at least for you know any of us who who loved language and loved excess and loved description and you know i felt so hemmed in by the mm -hmm. literary world of gordon lish and minimalism that to see her just gleefully kick that over and be as maximalist as possible was <laughs> was exciting in a way that I'm not sure you can grasp if mm. you are a young writer coming across Angela Carter today why that was so revolutionary so subversive so brave I, I will chime in just to say that I was I was finishing my MFA program at the moment still when the dominant voice was Raymond Carver yeah. and and writers of that that style. And so, yes, she was very important to me uh, for herself, but also as an example that there were other ways to approach possibility or language or, or um, delight and surprise. Um, I, I, had, I had a question for y'all who were reading her at the time that, that she was First publishing, which is um, the writer that I think about a great deal when I think about her is Joanna Russ, who has just had a library of, what is it, Library of America has just put out a, a sort of compendium. But I was thinking when you mentioned Oscar Wilde of the wonderful Joanna Russ story about Oscar Wilde and Hell assembling the, the puzzle um, and kicking it off the table at the end and, and going off to some other place. But those two writers to me have something mm. in common well when she first published she was categorized as science fiction in the bookshops huh. which was yeah, very strange I mean, that did happen and, and the passion of new eve i mean there are times when she does stray into that territory i don't think she minded i mean but it was just the way she was rather uncategorizable and she didn't have much you know she didn't really have a great she had a success a success d'esteem you know there were people who followed her and admired her editors who knew that she was marvellous, but she didn't have the, I mean, she never was shortlisted even for the booker, which is just a crying shame. And it made a difference, you know, she was not very well off. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had to work all the time. That's why she did so much creative writing work mm -hmm. in, in Iowa and other places, Australia. And in England, she was, her iconoclasm, her, her, her perversity actually kept her, she wasn't accepted. You know, I, I want to touch on that, um, that perversity in particular, because that was, uh, again, I, I, I feel so aware of the fact that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in such a different position with regard to her than, than the rest of you on this call. I, in, I came to an awareness of her as having been an important influence for a lot of writers engaging in uh, contemporary fantasy works that I was reading in the uh, the late 90s and early 2000s um, and so the people who were formative to me I, I was reading you know the the collections that uh, that Terry and Ellen Datlow edited uh, I was reading um, the the uh, urban the old urban fantasy the the more mythic fiction uh, the pre paranormal romance urban fantasy uh, stuff and people kept talking about Angela Carter and because of that I had some notion um, that her works would be like the works of the people who'd been influenced by her, which was completely, completely wrong. Um, when I when I first read the Bloody Chamber, I was I was blown away by how sexy it was. Like just, you know that, and and but and, sexy and from not a, always comfortably so. Exactly, uncomfortably sexy. Actually, I wanted to also no I I can't let this get away from me uh, when you when you brought up the. Um, uh, the the tiger's bride marina uh the thing that i first thought of was there's a, a very recent to my mind uh and contemporary extremely online expression of dissatisfaction with disney's um beauty and the beast because they like the beast when the beast is a beast you know that every like all of these um a, a, 
mostly women that I've seen saying this, saying that when they watched that as children, they were massively disappointed when the beast turned into a man, you know? They're like, very, it's not interesting very, anymore. He's just some dude. <laughs> like, the problem of the prince is always insipid. Exactly. They, they <laughs> wanted this, like, frightening, charismatic, magnetic figure that the beast was. And so, and and I also see like a lot of this expression of, no, we, we don't want the dragon to turn into a person. We want the dragon to stay a dragon, you know, in a lot of these stories. <laughs> and I, I feel like that is an impulse that speaks to what I see in the bloody chamber, this desire to be quite honest about those things, regardless of, you know, how they might seem or where they fit into a sort of taxonomy of correct feminist thought or orthodoxies around feminism and so on. Mm. Uh, I wonder, I'm, I'm trying to shape that into a question. <laughs> um, do you, um, do you feel in, I know that, um, uh, Terry, you're, you're currently writing uh, a novel inflected by, by fairy and fairy tale. Um, have you felt any resurgences of um, the, uh, the kinds of constraints that, that surrounded Carter's writing? Like the thing, you know, have you, have you felt like there are, how am I trying to phrase this? I'm not sure what you're asking. Yeah, I'm trying to think, like, do you feel like, when you use fairy tale now, do you feel like you're still drawing on the same wells of fairy tale that you encountered that were foundational to you? Or do you feel like your engagement with fairy tale has transformed over time um, to take in some of the new um, or more recent, maybe I should say, uh, engagements with it? It's certainly been changed by all of the feminist scholarship uh, and you know, a better understanding of the history of fairy tales. It's been changed by the work Marina's done and Maria Tatar has done. And uh, I, my understanding of these stories is different than when I encountered these stories as a child. So that's certainly true. Um, reading, rereading The Bloody Chamber after all these years in preparation for this talk, the and while I'm finishing up this book that also draws upon fairy tales, and therefore I can't say it's not uninfluenced by and my love of Angela Carter, I just, I was struck by her ferocity and her braveness mm -hmm. in not giving a flying, I won't swear on British Library's time, but, <laughs> I can't, you know, about political correctness. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are aspects of those stories that horrify me um, in you know, the, the, the snow child, you know, yes. the, the ending of the snow child is just, oh, yeah. you know, okay. But she didn't, so she, she, she did anger a lot of feminists by the fact that she wrote in this no holds barred way about sexuality, about power relationships between men and women, between men and very young women, um, girls. Uh, she, I, I'd like to, think that I could have some of her bravery and I'm going back to my own manuscript now after recently rereading the bloody chamber and saying but but have I been that brave have mm. I been that stark and honest without we live in a world where we care very much about judge the judgment of you know are we mm. are we taking the correct line in terms of identity and gender and all you know all these things we're so constrained by that and in many ways you know, it's wonderful that these concerns are there, but it's also liberating to read a writer who was not constrained, mm -hmm. just followed yeah. her muse wherever it took her. I used to teach Angela Carter to undergraduates, and um, it was at the bloody chamber, and it was extraordinary the effect it had on them. They were disturbed. They were mm -hmm. often shaken, They, especially the snow child, that kind of, and the Sardin quality. And yeah. we, we studied the Sardin woman as well with it. And um, she, um, and but they were, I mean, they could not be stopped from writing essays about her. I had to, at one stage, they <laughs> mustn't write any more essays about her. Says, but you've got to write about some other writer. Because they were, they were completely, because it, she had this way of speaking to what they were, were their forbidden and unspoken vicis, the vicissitudes of their emotions. They're not exactly their forbidden desires. I mean, nothing as corny as that, but actually it's things that were not represented 
in the, and this is 10 years ago, so it's got, it's got a bit worse, I'd say. So the mm. things we're not allowed to think or feel. And there, there, she, there she had it. She, she was expressing it. So these very young and very, un, in the University of Essex, so not particularly sophisticated um, Londoners or anything, were completely entranced, absolutely entranced by this truth-telling. Mm. I was still quite young when Bloody Chamber came out and I first read it. I must have been 20, tops, mm. 21. And there, I guess there are aspects of it that har horrified me. I've been thinking about this as we prepared for this talk, thinking it never occurred to me back then to not read a writer mm. because they went into areas that I disagreed with or where my their politics were different than mine, they're feminist, but it mm. never occurred to me for that to be a reason not to love what I loved about their work. Mm. And I'm not sure that's common today. I have seen, uh, I want to inject someone who I, I'd love for everyone to be more aware of, um, Lee Mandelo, who is a wonderful, wonderful writer and, uh, and, and scholar of queer studies, uh, has written, I think this is just Google this and find it, uh, wrote something for Tor.com about uh, Eve Sedgwick's theories of paranoid and reparative reading. Um, and specifically put it in the context of uh, today's, um, I think, possibly specifically fandom discussions of works, and that there is a tendency to read works in a paranoid way, where the work is out to get you, the work uh, has uh, some damage to confer onto you, can harm you in some ways, versus reading that same text in a reparative way. This is a very oversimplified. I, I apologize to everyone who's a scholar and who has a much more uh, rich take on this. But reading something in a reparative way can be exactly the same text, but the elements that you are taking from it uh, are are elements that in some way can, um, that there is some some dialogue between you and the text where you are uh, not being harmed by it. You are in fact being um, nourished in some way by it and that the same text can, prov can you can you can bring both attitudes to any text it's not something inherent necessarily in a text and and i i too have been uh upset and disturbed by a tendency to read with a a very um a paranoid and very literal i think approach to you know if a thing is bad in the real world it has to also be bad in text uh you can't have representations of bad things in text or on in some way you are reinscribing the bad thing on the world and everything around that uh is um everything surrounding or infusing the text is irrelevant to the fact of what is being represented in some way i mean uh, i think angela carter had a political reason for doing what she did Mm -hmm. she wanted to she wanted to touch the actual popular the, the veins of popular culture mm. and she found in popular culture she had she she liked words like rude and coarse i mean she she you know, she she was she was very concerned with that and she found a kind of truth as well, the phrase i used before truth telling quality in popular literature of which fairy tales were a branch but she liked pantomime which is huh. a very popular form of of um, ribald. She liked bawdy. She liked, you know, she was. And she, I, I saw Commedia dell'arte and Puss in Boots this yeah. week. Yes. Yeah. Another right. one. Yes. yes. Exactly. She put and, and the theatre, the popular mm -hmm. theatre, dance. I mean, Wise Children is all about you know showgirls, two pair of showgirls, and who dance. Who dance. I mean, she she liked that, and she felt that there people weren't hiding they weren't being polite what mm -hmm. she hated about in the very 60s way she hated about the bourgeoisie was its hypocrisy mm -hmm. she didn't want she didn't want hypocrisy the funny thing is that she actually her trajectory uh, coincides with the trajectory of Italo Calvino you know the great Italian oh. writer yeah. wonderful also a genre defying very different going through boundaries of different I mean sci-fi everything and he um he, he he was a communist and he began as a realist because Social realism was a sort of communist mode, but then he gave that up for his fantasy, his wonderful fantasies, because he saw that as much more popular, actually, not not elite, not learned, but actually getting to the roots of pleasure, huh. pleasure of culture. Oh, I, I love that. Yeah. I was, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that at the 
point when I was first reading Angela Carter that that it was also the age of the mass market paperback, mm. the mass market romance, the mass market gothic. Um, you had um, V.C. Andrews, uh, all of this sort of outrageous, um, transgressive um, sort of terrible things happening, but treated um, lightly or as entertainment. Um, and I have been thinking a great deal about how some of that, we don't have that anymore. We don't have this this enormous body of popular work in cheap mass market editions, uh, but what people uh, find instead now is, um, you know, self-published books about uh, rom monster romances, basically. Yeah. And I've thought a great deal about, um, you know, you have romances about a woman who goes to a planet of spiders and <laughs> a giant spider fall in love. And and there is something to me about that 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 uh, speaks to the kind of thing that that I loved about Angela Carter, that I loved in V.C. Andrews, which is this transgressive, um, here is a terrible thing, and but the characters will sort of pick themselves up and and go on. Um, sort of the same thing in Joan Aiken. And, um, you know how that how the that sort of uh, tension between the reading that says we cannot represent characters doing bad things because this this means that the work is not moral versus the enormous popularity of um, what if you met a really handsome orc um, yes. and had a lot of sex with this orc and like <laughs> the idea that 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 you know that both this reading in which uh bad things are bad and should not be written about but also here's a terrible thing happening or a really strange thing happening and let's just read that for fun and and the idea that both of these strands of reading exist at the same time i love that um i love that very much and and to kind of put fairy tales kind of at the the center of so many different possibilities of engagement i wanted to ask so I think the last question I want to ask the three of you before um, beginning to look at uh, the, the questions that have been accruing as we've been chatting is the, the very broad question is, I suppose, how do you in each of your work presently find yourselves engaging with fairy tale? Um, is it, uh, I mean, I, I I am a critic and I have my opinions about how each of you has done so. Uh, and I would like to not talk about that and instead just ask you as writers in your own, uh, as, as writers or even as, as, uh, as scholars or editors, you know, um, how, how do you find yourselves reaching for fairy tales in, in this moment in your work, um, knowing that it can cover so much terrain, that it can be so uh, transgressive, but also so, um, Re like uh, repetitive of you know the 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 interests and morals of a given moment and stuff. How do you find yourselves doing that? Just uh, anyone jump in. I'm not going to call on someone for this one. Well, I think it's tremendously important in our dislocated world and our violent world. And I think I think it's an inter it's an international language in the sense that it crosses borders. Every culture has its own set of fairy tales, its own characters, its own talking animals. You know, in Arabic literature, the two two jackals; in African literature, Anansi the spider. You know, there's 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 a huge body of enormous um, riches of imagination which crosses borders, and I think reactivating that and reanimating it through every means possible from the people themselves, but so many of them dislocated and in another place, is actually really a really important resource for for you know human contact for sympathy, for enjoyment, for laughter, you know, for, I mean, for festivity, for all these things. I think it's really, really important glue that um, we could we could tap in. And I think one of the reasons that culture is being here, you know, cut down, curtailed and so forth is because they precisely don't want that to happen. They mm -hmm. want hostilities to flourish. Whereas if we all got into telling each other stories from our own cultures, we would, we would be, that's my view, anyway. We would be happy. I when you were up at the uh, fantasy con conference in Glasgow a couple of summers ago, you used the phrase, we need to reoccupy narrative. 
Yes, I remember that. And that just uh, that says it for me. And 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 fairy tale narrative is a is a language that so many of us have in common. Exactly. Just, I I never get tired of reoccupying fairy tale narrative because it always speaks to the moment, mm -hmm. and it always connects you to people who have used these images and these themes and these plots mm -hmm. in the past, and it always connects you to people who will continue to do so in the future. Mm -hmm. I think. Um that the i'm gonna very quickly mention a thing that um a writer mariana enriquez said uh yes. talking about why she writes horror and she said um to write her um you are giving something that is terrible or traumatic or horrific space in which it can be treated as something terrible as opposed to real life where you're bombarded with things that are true that are terrible at the same time that you are seeing things that are funny that you are seeing uh the minutia of people's days and i think that is true for fairy tales for me as well that they are moments that give the proper weight not just to moments of horror but moments of um of delight or or wonder um and they're they're for me it's a fairy tales that I when I write I may not necessarily be writing a fairy tale but I do want to I do ask myself am I allowing for the largeness of 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 events that that fairy tales allow for that large things can transpire in in very small compact spaces whether they're large things of language or events or um, you know, actions that characters take, that, that the fairy tale is a, a rule of thumb for me. And there's stories of transformation. You know, there's stories about how, how we survive calamity, how we save, if not a whole world, then ourselves or our own souls. There, what could be more basic, more human than that? particularly you know, in troubled times. And we all, we have always lived in troubled times. Each generation lives in troubled times. But these are bad. These are bad times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we need stories that tell us how to get through the dark of the wood and transform the world around us. Yes, Angela Carter had a very good phrase, you know, which she, I think, repeated quite often in her life, which is the spirit of heroic optimism. Mm. The heroic part being... You know, that it wasn't really founded in anything to be so optimistic, but the stories are full of this spirit of heroic optimism. Mm. We'll get through the wood. Mm. And we need that more than ever. Mm. I agree. What a beautiful note to uh, to, to bring this um, tremendous conversation to uh, pause as I um, look at these questions um, that we have here. Um, I think some of these got answered uh, as we chatted, uh, which I think is very perspicacious of us. Uh, we're, we're doing great. Um, so, oh, can any of the panel name a few other writers really worth seeking out that are working in a similar vein to Angela Carter? Uh, I would love to hear your perspectives on this. I can start with a couple. Um, Daniel Lavery, uh, whose collection, The Mary Spinster, uh, is very uh, voice driven, uh, very wicked, uh, very body, very profane. Um, <laughs> Helen Oyeyemi, who will have a new book out um, yes, yes. called Parasol Against the X. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Megan Giddings, The Woman Could Fly, uh, which is one of my favorite novels of the last few years. Mm. That's beautiful. There are just so many wor people working in interesting ways with fairy tales. Um, I'm not, uh, and no one is quite Angela Carter, and nobody should be. But um, the, I would add, um, God, I don't even know where to start. First of all, we haven't mentioned Tanith Lee, whose Red is Blood yes. collection came out in, what was it, 1982, 83, not too long after the Bloody Chamber, and certainly was informed by it, and has informed all the fairy tale literature in the fantasy field that's come since. Um, that's a real classic. And other people working today, I, I agree with Helen 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, she's amazing. Michael Cunningham is doing interesting things with fairy tales. Uh, Christopher Barzak has a new collection out that's steeped in fairy tales. Nice to get some men in here. Um, uh, Margaret Atwood, of course, is very, I mean, Margaret Atwood has done a lot of different things, but she's also done a lot of work with fairy tales and some of her poetry, too. And A.S. Byatt. I wanted to throw in um, Elwyn Cotman, uh, who has a collection called Dance on Saturday that was put out by Small Beer Press, uh, and mm -hmm. I was absolutely, absolutely dazzled by it. Um, and like that, I, I'm, I'm actually struggling to think if there's any fairy tale connection, but it is that that the, yeah. the instinct towards pleasure and towards profanity and uh, uh, just oh, just tremendous stuff. Like the, the titular story in particular um, has, I, I just keep thinking about it. And he has a collection coming out soon, I think as well. Do you remember the title, Kelly? I, uh, Weird Black Girls. Weird Black Girls, that's right. And he does, he has a, um, a the the Swan Brothers. He has a Swan. That's oh, right, yeah. yes. I love yes. That story. Fabulous. Yes. Yeah, was there's, there's, a got, there's a Gothic, I mean, there is a tributary from Angela Carter, which is Gothic. So mm. what goes into gothic fiction one has got a huge field. Hmm. Absolutely. Emma uh, Donahue's Kissing the Witch is also magnificent. Oh, yeah. um, a a Angela Slater in Australia and, and also Kate Forsyth are doing very interesting things with fairy tales. Um, Kate Atkinson's Jane, new collection. Um, Fly, Fly Away mm -hmm. is... is uses the language of fairy tales in a contemporary story oh god we we should we there's should so not... much i know i'm, I'm actually just reading through the, the questions it. so uh, i thought i would just let you keep recommending things while i uh i i look at the questions some more um Cat howard Cat howard roses and rot neil gaiman oh, yeah of course did yeah, you yeah. Did, did you say neil gaiman yeah <laughs> <laughs> howard, howard waldrop and who... again howard waldrop's Stories oh. often use fairy tales. He yeah. recently passed away. Um, all right, I have another question here for us. Uh, so, um, hello from Oklahoma, says Sarah P. Uh, I've only read the Infernal Desire Machines of Dr. Hoffman and The Passion of New Eve, and they contain a great deal of sexual content and gender consideration slash debate. Do any of you feel that Carter's works could have a resurgence due to the current LGBTQIA and feminist debates? Uh, it seems things are only getting more complex and perhaps her works could contribute to the conversation. I, I think so. I mean, I think that probably some of her principles are very different from one's now definition. But The Passion of New Year is a fantastic study of cross-gender transformations. And it's very, I mean, it's, it's, it's full of amazing energy and energy of imagination that she has and, and wicked wit. So, but I, I, it's, not, it's not an easy read. It's not, I mean, it's, it's another example of her, her being rather uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. I imagine in the context of discussions of trans and so forth, this would be an uncomfortable read. Um, I have another question here for uh, specifically to Kelly Link, uh, in parentheses, my favorite short story writer. Um, both you and Angela Carter play with animal transformation, Tiger's Bride for Angela Carter, White Cat and Cat Skin for Kelly Link, uh, to get at the more carnal or uh, the more carnal emotions beneath the skin. How do you find that allows you and allowed Angela Carter to dive away from gender or deeper into it? And how does gender inform your writing of animal transformation? What a great question. Yeah. It is a great question. And I think that it might take me a couple of years to come up with an answer to it. <laughs> uh, I, uh, boy, no, I really will need more time to think about that. Um, I, I do think all the time now of, uh, one of Joy Williams' uh, rules for short stories, which is an animal to give its blessing um, mm -hmm. in the in the story. Oh, that's <laughs> lovely. I've never yeah, heard it, that. it is. That. I, I think that, um, you know, you can probably assign a lot of different meanings to that. Um, my, one of my very favorite uh, takes on, on uh, gender, um, identity, things like that is, uh, Carol M. Schwiller's um, book, Carmen Dog, oh, uh, which is very much a fairy tale, 
in which all the animals in the world, um, many animals become be, begin to become women, women begin to become animals. And I read that in my 20s and was blown away by it. And I think I am heavily influenced by, by that very short novel. Mm -hmm. Very lovely. Do do any of uh, do either of uh, you, Terry or Marina, have thoughts about um, gender and animal transformation in your own work? Well, I had I just recently collaborated with my son, oddly enough, on a, really in a show in a for a show. He's an artist for a show on Leder and the Swan. We were asked by the curator to work together. I provided the words, really, but in a, in the show, a lot of other artists had had actually grappled with Leder having sex with a swan mm. and so, and some of the women did it very very graphically i mean very close up and very graphic <laughs> which is of course not really how the myth struck me i mean i wasn't sort of thinking anatomically but anyway they thought quite anatomically about it sometimes in figurative ways so so sometimes, <laughs> um my son my son i may say did her baby's castor and pollux so it was very <laughs> very chaste <laughs> but um, and they love each other very much, so it was a very nice uh, thing. But 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 I was interested that the women took the story in a in a kind of they really wanted to experience it in close up. I mean, they wanted to f identify with the swan, with the what what it would be like to have sex with a swan. Mm -hmm. The men f fought really shy of that. Huh. <laughs> well, they... oh. go ahead. I was going to ask, just out of curiosity, were the men feeling shy about the thought of a swan having sex with them or of them being in the position of the swan having sex with a woman? Yeah. Okay. They didn't, they didn't want to. And it's a rape. I mean, in the swan, yeah. it's a rape. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Um, all right. I'm utterly obsessed with animal transformation stories and um, animal bride and bridegroom stories have been for many, many years. It's particularly evident in my work as a painter, which mm. is all about that. But there's, there's, it's in the, my novel, The Woodwife. It's in the novel I'm working now. I, 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 and I don't even know why I'm so obsessed with it, but it's something I've studied as a folklorist. But there's something about that, um, finding the wild in ourselves, finding the wild in the people we in, that live beside you know the, the the parts of them that are other and unknowable no matter how well we think they know them that 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 crossing the line between the human and the more than human i just find find utterly and and, and and there's a sort of a question of beauty too isn't there mm. i mean there's a, I, there's a wonderful short story by leonora carrington there are mm. many wonderful stories in which there are animals but there's one short story in which virginia fur makes love to Ignami, the bull, the, the boar, the boar. And she says that he doesn't show, he, he doesn't, doesn't show her all his beauty, his russet bucket, buttocks, because he doesn't want to show her all his beauty in one go. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> I, I wanted to just throw in, because I've thought of it, um, there is a short story by Virginia Woolf that I never see people talk about and that I wish more people did. It's called Lapin and Lapinova. And it's a, uh, it's a story. Um, I think it's, you can find it in a haunted house and other stories, I think, but um, it's a story of a newlywed couple and the woman in this couple has this develops with her new husband, this rich shared fantasy world in which they are both rabbits in which like there, <laughs> there is King Lapin and Queen Lapinova. That's really extraordinary. It's and and then the, the places that that story goes are, are very heartbreaking and, and like tremendously moving to me. And I think if, if anyone is interested to me, there is something in there that is very Carter esque, even though obviously much earlier. Um, if you're interested in Angela Carter, I'd like highly recommend someone just reading this story and going, oh, yeah, Virginia Woolf also wrote this, you know, not just things I was assigned at various points in, uh, in school. Speaking of which, um, I wanted to turn to a very charming question. Uh, uh, charming in this phrasing. Um, Matilda Felix Jude asks, I'm interested in what each of your favorite stories is in the Bloody Chamber. Also, please, could you shout out our excellent A-level English lit teacher, Miss Hayes? 
Uh, so <laughs> shout out to Miss Hayes. Um, and yeah, do do each of you have a favorite story in this collection specifically? Um, yeah, we'll stop. One. go for it, Kelly. Uh, maybe the the house of the Lady of Love. I I just that is the story that I can go back to every time and read something different in it. Mm. I, I think I like the title story best, which is very the longest, the Bloody Chamber. It's so extraordinary, the invention of it, the intensity of it. I'm going to cheat a little bit because I have to name two because they're published together, which is The Courtship to Mr. Lion and The tig Tiger Bride. Yes. Because, because of the juxtaposition of the two coming right together in the collection yes, yes. you get these two different takes on beauty and the beast and they're both utterly delicious but yes. in completely different modes oh, i love that all right i'm gonna see do we have one last uh question oh yes all right uh I'm very partial to this question because it's something that I find myself often asking in zooms um when you know occasion demands Kelly are those Baba Yaga earrings in parentheses I love them they are <laughs> yes yes <laughs> excellent <laughs> I just I just personally love it when you know when all we can see is this frame of our heads when we go hard with earrings uh it delights me um, so thank you to uh, Richard Marlowe for asking that. Um, and uh, oh, this is okay. This is an interesting question. I'm gonna. I think it's it's one of those difficult questions where you can feel free to reject the premise of the question, but I'm I'm still quite interested in it. Um, which is uh, so uh, Daniel? Um, I I'm not sure how to pronounce his surname. Sini or Chini uh, says, which is the Angela Carter story you wish you had written? And it's an interesting framing. Um, I, I think a lot of authors get this question and then also reject this question with something uh, like I feel certainly a sense of um, uncertainty with it. Uh, there are, however, definitely stories few and far between that make me feel that specific thing. And so if you do, please feel free to say so. If not, uh, feel free to reconstitute the question however you like. I think I've longed to write an Angela Carter story all my life. <laughs> <laughs> so and I wouldn't really choose one, but I, because I also think her later novels are amazing and they're very different in their feel. Mm. They're, you know, they're much more joyous and uh, they are and, and full of exhilarating joie de vivre in some ways. But um, I still love them. I think her spirit was wonderful. I. She is too to herself, too unique for me to have want to want to have written her. Yeah. Anything of her. She's just too unique. And I've only ever, in all my years of editing and working with writers and reading, and the I've only ever once in my life experienced reading something that I thought, damn, I wish you wrote that. But it is fairy tales, so I'll mention it, which is the children's book by A.S. Byatt. Mm. If I could have written that book, I'd die mm. happy. Mm. <laughs> I, I, she I would. Just died. She died herself just recently. Yeah. Mm. I would give a lot just for more um, Angela Carter stories. Um, I think of the stories that I've written, the one to me that seems most heavily influenced by two writers, Angela Carter and a good friend of mine, um, Shelley Jackson, is Gatskin where I, I think I was very heavily influenced by some of the things that, that Angela Carter does. And I would add Shelley Jackson to the list of people to read um, if you were looking for more stuff in the vein of Angela Carter. Absolutely. Mm. These are these are all beautiful answers. And I wanted to say with one minute left, um, this is basically our time. I want to thank everyone who asked uh, thoughtful and lovely questions. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank each of you for your time and your thoughts and your experience that you've shared on this panel. I, I, I feel I've written so many notes that are going to be treasure that I carry into the rest of uh, my weeks and stuff. So thank you all so much for your contributions. 
Uh, I also want to thank the British Library uh, for uh, for organizing this um, this tremendous, sprawling, beautiful exhibition on fantasy. I feel like something like this has been long needed, and I'm so thrilled and honored to have gotten to participate in it in this way specifically with the three of you. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you to our tech people um, who have also kept this on point, uh, doing wonderful camera work in the background. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful uh, weekend and that uh, that people who've been watching this, thank you, of course, to the wonderful audience watching this, um, that you can carry something of Angela Carter's iconoclastic spirit forward into your own lives. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.